In 1847, an artist named James Mahoney depicted the distressing situation that was unfolding in Ireland. He created haunting images of the desperation and despair of mothers who were weeping and wailing as they cradled the emaciated and starving bodies of their children. The streets were filled with masses of people whose bones jutted out from under their tattered clothing, begging for a few coins to afford a coffin. Once fertile potato fields were ravaged, with the stocks blackened by a deadly pathogen. The Great Hunger, as it was known, claimed the lives of one million people, which was 11% of Ireland's population in just seven years. The effects of this disaster have been felt for generations, as the nation's population to this day has never fully recovered. Even after the dust had settled, Ireland continued to be impoverished. The industrialization that was sweeping through Europe passed them by, and coupled with a relative lack of natural resources, societal unrest, and decades of disastrous economic policies, Ireland remained a backward, largely agrarian society well into the 20th century. This earned them the unflattering title of the sick man of Europe. By the 1970s, Ireland appeared to be trapped in a cycle of stagnation, with its citizens experiencing subpar standards of living, and many of them finding migrating away as their only chance for finding opportunity. Yet today, if you look at a list of the world's richest nations, you'll see something truly astounding. If you exclude micronations, Ireland is now the second richest country in the world. Its citizens are among the most educated, wealthy, and happiest of any nation. But to the naked eye and the foundational principles of macroeconomics, it makes little sense how this was achieved so rapidly. Unlike the other countries on the list, Ireland does not have any inherent qualities that make it specially primed for prosperity. It does not have trillions of dollars of oil like Norway and Qatar. Its population is not minute like Luxembourg and Singapore, which makes it harder to achieve rapid growth. And it's not more educated or historically wealthy like Switzerland. Maybe the most bizarre thing about Ireland's economy today is that it continues to grow at rates that should not be possible for a highly developed nation. For example, in 2015, while the aggregate GDP growth of the other five nations discussed was 2.76%, Ireland's was 25.2%, the fastest of any nation in the world. It therefore appears as though Ireland is primed to become the richest nation in the world. But how exactly did Ireland become so incredibly rich so quickly, and is this economic miracle just too good to be true? It cannot be overstated just how difficult life was for the Irish in the 19th century. At the time, Ireland was under the control of the British Empire, which not only exploited the country's resources, but also treated its people as second-class citizens. The Irish economy was archaic, with 90% of the workforce engaged in simple agriculture, most of which was subsistence farming. To make matters worse, laws and social traditions dictated that all sons would inherit equal shares of their father's land, leading to smaller and smaller plots with each successive generation. This meant less food and less efficiency in production, as small plots were inferior to larger estates in terms of their ability to invest in better tools and allocate labor more efficiently. As a result, the population was trapped in ever-worsening conditions. When combined with Ireland's lack of coal, iron, and insufficient capital, the prospect of industrializing like its neighboring nations was impossible. By the time Southern Ireland became independent, some 70 years after the famine, it had only a few factories, the traditional economic model of heavy industry and manufacturing. Instead, they focused on attracting foreign investment in the form of multinational corporations, offering a highly educated and skilled workforce, favorable tax policies, and other incentives. This strategy proved to be wildly successful, and by the late 1990s, Ireland had become known as the Celtic Tiger with its economy growing at an unprecedented rate of 10% per year. This growth was fueled by a boom in the technology sector, with companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple all setting up operations in Ireland. However, the rapid growth also led to some downsides, 
including a housing bubble that burst in 2008, causing a severe recession. But despite this setback, Ireland's economy has continued to grow, and as of 2021, it remains one of the fastest growing economies in Europe. It was time for Ireland to make a change once again. The country decided to open up its economy, cut taxes for Irish workers, and roll back government spending. These measures were designed to attract more foreign investment by multinational corporations, just like in 1958. However, this time, Ireland wanted to ensure that the benefits of this investment would reach Irish workers. To achieve this goal, the country overhauled employment regulations, making it easier to hire and fire workers. These measures made Ireland the third most business-friendly nation in the world, and they set the stage for one of the most dramatic economic transformations in history. Within a decade, Ireland went from being one of the poorest Western European nations to one of the richest. In 1993, Ireland became a part of the European Union's single market. This led to a substantial reduction in trade regulations between European Union members, which made trade much cheaper and easier. For Ireland, this resulted in a quadrupling of the value of its agricultural exports. The country also received significant subsidies and loans for education, infrastructure, and human capital investment. However, the most important benefit for Ireland was that it now had a backdoor into the European market that multinational corporations could use to avoid tariffs and taxes. This, combined with Ireland's low corporate tax rate, well-educated English-speaking workforce, and prime geographical location between the United States and Europe, made Ireland an incredibly attractive location for U.S. companies to relocate or expand their operations. This was especially true for high-tech manufacturing, research and development, and financial services. The timing of this was perfect, as the U.S. was undergoing its own economic boom with very low interest rates, which supercharged investments. The amount of investment that flooded into Ireland in the 1990s was colossal. Within 10 years, foreign investment went from 2.2% of Ireland's economy to an astounding 49.2%. As a result, unemployment dropped sharply, and the market was now littered with well-paying jobs. During this time, the average Irish worker's wages went from two-thirds that of British workers to being 20% higher. The steep cuts to the income tax rate meant that Irish citizens now had much more disposable income than ever before, which they used to stimulate the economy. While taxes were low, the scale of economic growth enabled the government to ramp up spending on everything from infrastructure to modernizing cities and attracting even more companies. As these companies then racked up profits and stored them in Irish bank accounts to avoid taxes in their home countries, Ireland enabled them to freely spend it in the country by largely allowing them to do so with little to no extra taxes. This created a positive feedback loop for investment. By 2007, Ireland's economy had increased almost sixfold, making it the third richest nation on the continent and 40% richer than its former British ruler. However, this growth came with some trade-offs. Ireland's rapid growth had made its economy very reliant upon U.S. corporations, U.S. banks, and cheap interest rates. As a result, its economy was hyper-exposed to the global economy. Income inequality also rose significantly, although it was still lower than the European average. Perhaps the largest drawback was that as its population boomed and disposable incomes increased rapidly, the cost of living shot through the roof. Combined with low interest rates and a lack of government oversight, Ireland's housing market formed a gigantic bubble. Private debts rose in turn, and eventually, the nation was home to the second-highest average household debts in the world. Along with runaway government spending, Ireland's economy had become fundamentally weak and vulnerable to global shocks. This proved to be disastrous as the world entered the Great Recession. As the U.S. housing market collapsed violently in 2007, eventually taking the world's economy with it, Ireland was hit particularly hard. Housing prices in Dublin decreased by 56%, widespread defaults sent banks into crisis, 
and unemployment rose sharply as companies laid off significant portions of their workforce. The entire economy contracted by almost a quarter. As the Irish government stared down the barrel of bankruptcy, it asked and received a titanic bailout by the IMF in the European Union worth 67.5 billion euros, or 40% of Ireland's total GDP. As concessions for the dramatic bailout, the government took harsh austerity measures, including a significant decrease in state employees' pay, the closing of some 41 government institutions, and a general decrease in government spending. The economy stabilized and then started modest growth by 2013. Yet it appeared as though the Irish economic miracle had finally come to an end, but something truly strange happened in 2015. Ireland reported that in a strange turn of events, its economy was now growing faster than any other country in the European Union. Be sure to subscribe and enable notifications to view future information about global economics and business. Until next time.